All right. So hello everybody, welcome to lecture 15 of quantum computation. Uh, in the last uh, class, I had discussed the Deutsch Joshua algorithm, and uh, and then I had uh, given you all a homework assignment, which was basically to implement uh, lab one from the QIS kit book. And so right now, what we are doing is we are we are talking. We are I'm just answering certain lot doubts that students have. So whenever you get an error, one way to one, the first thing a person should do if you're using Python is to look up the help documentation for that function. And the rest of you, please don't mind. I'm I'm just narrating this for whoever might be listening to the to the video at a later stage. Okay, na? So as an example, we are looking at the initialize the quantum circuit initialize. Um, Uh, function, right? So when we say, is it when we say quantum circuit dot initialize then question mark, it brings up this this help menu. Now you can notice here that on the right side there is a little button here. If you click that, you get a pop out of the same thing, right? So if you want to look at it in a different window, you can use that. If you are happy looking at it in the same window, you can you can leave it be. And then you have this bar, you can pull, pull it up and down if you want to resize. So what does quantum circuit.initialize do? First of all, in all Python functions, you will see this first argument, which says self. Don't worry about that, ignore that, okay? Then, th so think of this, this is the first argument, param, and the second argument is qubit, right? So param specifies the state that you want to initialize your qubits to, and the second argument specifies which qubits you want to initialize that in that state. So for instance, uh, if I have a circuit like this, right? Uh, a three qubit circuit. So these are my three qubits, Q0, 1, and 2. Now let's say I want to initialize qubit 2, right? I want to initialize it into the plus state. Right, which is zero plus one and then divided by root two. But I don't want to touch zero, the first and second qubit. So what would be the call to initialize look like? It would look like, like the, right, I would say QC dot initialize. And then param, in params, there are different ways of specifying the state, right? In the in my case, I want to specify the amplitudes of the state, right? So you can look in this help. Uh, right, so I would specify that these are the amplitudes, right? And if I, if I give these amplitudes, it will this corresponds to the plus state. But now I want this action to take place uh, to be applied to which qubit? To this last qubit, right? So this this second optional argument is what determines to which qubits does this apply? Okay. Then another way to in, uh, specify the state, right? Is that you can use a string representation like 0, 1, 1, 0, let's say, right? But now, and let's say you have a seven qubit circuit, right? So the if you don't specify the second argument, the function will, Take this state and initialize the first four qubits in this in this state. Okay, but let's say you want uh, you want a different set of qubits, right? You want let's say qubits two to two to, uh, the second qubit to the second third fourth fifth, right? So then you specify which qubits one two three and four, and then it will apply this state to those to that set of cubes. Is that is that fine, Rakshat? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. And the reason that you were getting a index error here, right? So coming back to your earlier question, index out of bounds, what does that mean? 
So for instance, here in this uh, example, uh, let me try to, uh, there is a, There's an Apple shortcut for this screen zoom. I can't find it anyway, Never mind. So you are saying circuit dot initialize zero one. So how does it interpret this? It interprets zero as the state, right? And one as the qubit, uh, this thing, qubit parameter, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, so, okay. So the question is, what is this state? Fine, let's say that it interprets this correctly as the zero state even though you have not specified this in the string format, right? It should be quoted. Then it will look for the second argument. Now the second argument you should specify qubits is equal to which qubit you want to initialize, right? So assuming that, okay, fine. Even with the incorrect format specification, the function understands that you want to specify, uh, this is the qubit but your circuit only has one, one quantum bit. So the index of that bit can only be zero. Yeah. yeah. Right. So if you run this, you will get an index out of bounds error. Is this fine? Yes, okay. but I just uh, tried it for uh, circuit dot initialize one comma zero. And again, it gave the same error. Baba, are you putting the one, are you putting the one, are you using this format? I, I, are you, are you saying uh, you have to use, use the format in which the function. So if you want, if you have one, one qubit, okay. If you have one qubit and you want to initialize it in the one state, what do you say? You do this. And let's say you have, you want to specify the qubit. You have to, you have to say this. It will not understand if you just say one comma zero, it won't understand that. Did you use this? Did you use this, uh, no, this format? No, no. no. So, I mean, uh, programming languages are not so smart as yet, right? That they will understand what our intentions are, right? I mean, they're, they're getting there. Uh, believe it or not, uh, but uh, they're not there yet. So we have to follow the, the, the format of the, of the code, right? Of course, what you can always do is you can define a new function, which is a wrapper. Wrapper, not, not like 50 cent. Okay. <laughs> it's like W R A P P E R wrapper, right? it wraps another function. So for instance, I can define some function QC def um, my initialize, and then I can pass it the arguments in the way I want. And then in the, in, in the function definition, I can take those arguments, which are sent in the format that I want, unwrapped and pass to the actual function call in the proper way. So anyway, that's, that's just a bit of basic coding uh, technology, All right? All right, any other questions? Sir, continuing okay. with Rakshit's question, is there any yeah. way to initialize classical bits as well? Uh, there should be, uh, there, there should be, I, I, haven't, I haven't thought about it. Um, Probably, maybe. Well, and so when <laughs> when in doubt, what do you do? What's up? When in doubt, what what should one do? So Google or library. Exactly. So you say QIS kit, and then what is your? All right. Initialize classical register. Right. And there we go. We have a stack exchange answer. So let's see. Is there anybody? Da, 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 
right initializing right so apparently there is uh, no direct way of initializing a classical register but what you can do right is you can construct some a circuit like this where you have a quantum bit and then you have a measurement on that quantum bit right and then that measurement is stored in this classical register so if you want to initialize this classical register to 1 right by default i would assume that it's initialized to 0 or something like that but let's say you want to initialize it to 1 what do you do you you initialize the quantum bit in the one state and then you this circuit will uh, initialize the classical bit to be in the to right with the one value right yes yes sir. and 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 for instance this this is a very nice a uh, bit of code right so let's see let's see what the uh, person what is the, who is the person uh, please we should ye uh, wang wang ye xian right chinese so the last name comes first and uh, we are not savages so we should follow the uh, customs proper customs right so wang ye xian right so we have this etc etc so you have this quantum register variable okay so quantum register is another alias for qubit okay so if you say this qr is equal to quantum register 1 you are saying okay this is one qubit and similarly cr0 is classical register but when you say 5 right what does that mean okay so let's see did i uh, did i import my uh which one is this this is not one second let me just open up um yeah where is this yeah one okay yeah okay this is the one right i, I yeah i have i've done the import also okay good so we have quantum register and we have classical register right so let's look at classical register again let's look at the help uh, this thing now you see the arguments are given as follows size equal to none name equal to none bits equal to none so all three arguments are optional right if you don't specify any argument it'll just say none 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 now what is the first argument it says the number of bits to include in the register right so going back to this answer when the when he says classical register 5 it creates a single classical register which has a size of five classical bits okay then you create a circuit using quantum circuit you pass it first this list of quantum register which one you which is this one and then the classical register okay so this is another way to build a circuit now right and then immediately we put a measure gate right on the qubit and we store the value in a classical register but now a classical register has some size i mean it has some some more than one bit it right by default your classical registers only hold one bit right but this way of initializing allows you to create a classical register which has size of n bits so how do you access those n bits you access them like this you say the register name and then the bit index right so if you have five bits you have indices from 0 to 4 right what's up you are you following yes sir i mean if you uh, get lost at some point ask me okay so 
what does the the first bit contain after this step the first bit contains zero right because the qubit is in the zero state then you apply an x gate now when you apply an x gate what happens the state of the qubit becomes one then you perform a measurement right and you put it in the second bit right so what are you putting into the second bit you are putting one right uh what about okay i think i got disconnected okay i'm back right are we back yes sir okay so right so we put one into the second bit or or actually the third bit of a register all right and then we do the same thing again measure well that will just put another one uh in the fourth bit then we perform another x right so what will be the after you have done this the series of steps what will be the final value of the of the register right so uh you you are putting uh 0 uh 0 0 1 1 but then again you are putting 0 so it becomes 0 1 0 and then you're putting another x so it becomes 0 1 0 1 no okay uh, it becomes 0 0 1 0 1 that is the final value a uh, set of values in this register you can work out the exact exact number right okay so the uh, I think this this answers the question about how to initialize a class in register. Okay, any other question? Okay, so uh, if there are no other questions, then I think I'll get started with uh, what I was planning on doing today, which is talking about the quantum Fourier transform. Okay, now. can you all uh, really quickly raise your uh, hands if you know what the fourier transform is recording in progress okay all right uh the rest Okay, Rachid, not very sure now. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Varsha, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Are you? Do you know what a what a Fourier transform is? Yes, sir. Then raise your hand now. Otherwise, how am I able to tell uh, who knows or who doesn't know? So, okay. Uh, so do i take this to mean that the rest of you who have not raised your hand navin ujwal utsav shankrava and papu and rakshit that you guys don't know what a fourier transform is is that correct sir i know what it is uh sir not able to raise my hand you are not able to raise your hand okay fine yes, uh, sir i don't uh, sir i don't know sir you navin you don't know okay all right so so there there are there are a small number of people you can all lower your hands thanks who uh, don't know what it is but most of you do okay so since it's a it's a small minority i won't go into great detail about what the fourier transform is all right i'll instead i'll i'll share some a link to some reading material some background reading material and then later this week i'll have a tutorial session which you know where you can where i'll explain these things for those who are interested okay but again please remember uh, that when i 
tell you that okay i'm going to have a tutorial session you have to respond and express some interest or you know otherwise of course there's no point in my uh, making such a such an offer all right okay so i will get started with uh, the topic for today which is uh, the uh, uh, quantum fourier transform and uh, let me ask does anybody have to leave early yes sir uh what time uh, six o'clock there's another okay. class okay great so well i'll 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 just cover what i can in 20 minutes okay and so obviously this will be a session that will continue in the next class okay all right so uh very quickly just to remind ourselves what is a fourier transform right so let's say you have some function f of x okay so we would say that this is this is a function we will refer to this as the or uh, instead let's say a function f of t okay so we would refer to this as a function which is in the time domain right so for instance this could be uh, right any or an audio recording right or any other signal as a function of time so what is the the fourier transform of this look like well the fourier transform would would be written as follows um right so this is a fourier transform is one of a family of of transforms which go by the name of integral transforms right so this is an integral transform there are others such as a laplace transform and others uh, so what is the physical meaning of this so we take our f of t we integrate it with respect to some exponent minus i omega t okay what are we doing here so actually one of the best ways to understand the fourier transform is to think about uh, quantum mechanics okay so let me write down a state right of some of a of a system in one dimension ket psi okay so how do i write ket psi i write it like this where what are this what is this ket x this is the position basis these are the position eigen states right so particle can be at any point along the on the line so if i have if i have something like this x and x what do i get i get delta x x prime right i get i get this dirac delta function right now the thing is that this is one basis but you can always transform to a different basis right so for instance i want to write things in the momentum basis okay so now if i have a momentum eigen state this is my momentum eigen state right how do i write the momentum eigen state first of all 
in terms of my position basis, I write it like this, e to the power minus i p x cat x d. Okay, why is this a position eigenstate? Because you can take the position operator minus i h bar d by dx, right? Sorry, the momentum operator, my mistake, what am I saying? This is the momentum operator. Right? And if you take this momentum operator and you, and you act on this eigenstate, uh, and then there's a factor of h bar here that I forgot. What will happen? You will get, uh, and then this would be plus, I think. You will get this number p, which is in the exponential when you take the derivative. So this tells you that, that this object is an eigenstate of momentum. So now I have my, my original state, right? I can write it in my position basis, right? But I can also write it equally well in the momentum basis. Okay. This, this is for, for a continuous, for a particle which, which you know, has a continuum of states. And people have difficulties. It's, it's harder to work with this continuous kind of uh, state space. So let's, let's work with something discrete, okay? So we have a discrete set of position, okay? And each position corresponds to a single state. Then how would we write our eigen, our, our, the state of our system? We would write it like this, right? We would say something like this, right? So this represents a superposition of the particle in the different position eigenstates, right? Now I can transform to a different basis, which is the momentum basis as I've said before. So in the discrete case, what do the momentum eigenstates look like? In the continuous case, the momentum eigenstates have this expression, right? In the discrete case, there is, there is a discrete, a finite number of position eigenstates, right? So your position eigenstates, there's a, there's a discrete number of them. What that implies is that you will also have a finite and discrete number of momentum, momentum states. Okay. And I'll just state this for the time being without uh, explaining how it comes about, but it is just the analog uh, of this expression for the integral, right? It's just a discrete version of this integral. I have the same phase factor that I had in the uh, continuous case, but now my states are labeled by some number, one to n, my position state. So my momentum states will also be labeled by some number and there will be n of those. So I'll call this my position momentum state P of I. Then my phase factor would be I. I is square root of minus one, okay? P I multiplied by X J divided by H bar, right? And multiplied by my X J. And then I sum over my position eigenstate. Right. 
so for for reference let me let me just copy this expression down here so you can look at these and see the similarities okay so this is a this is a momentum eigen state and um i will leave it for you as an exercise to show that these momentum eigen states are orthogonal to each other okay so show that if you have two such states okay pi and pj then you get delta ij and uh, there has to be a factor of 1 by root n which i forgot normalization factor now um now i have my state which i wrote above earlier as some superposition of my position eigen state right but since these momentum eigen states right these momentum eigen states you can see that they that they form an orthonormal set of states right and there are n of them so what does that imply this implies that these momentum states they form an they form a basis for my hilbert space right since they form a basis i can take any state any vector and expand it in terms of these basis vectors right i don't have to use the position basis i can use the momentum basis i is 1 to n okay i'll put a little this wiggly tilde just to indicate that i am in a this right now i want to determine so well before going further i'll just tell you very quickly this object is the fourier transform of psi i okay and uh earlier i started out by talking about a function and the fourier transform of the function so so what where does this function come into the picture when i talk about a quantum state the function is basically this coefficient right this set of coefficients so if i have a discrete signal or a discrete function then i will have a set of numbers right for instance psi i and then the fourier transform of that would be another discrete set of numbers now i want to understand how can i go uh, between these two expressions how can i go from here to here right so well what do i do i want to extract i want to extract this coefficient okay tilde psi i how do i do that well let me first write down the expression okay what am i doing here i'm just taking my state right and i'm taking the dot product of that state with the ith basis vector right so i'm just taking the projection so if you if you want to think in terms of your what you are accustomed to you have some vector which is some written in terms of some basis vectors then how would you extract this coefficient u of i you would take the dot product of the vector with the basis vector right that's exactly what we are doing here right but now this state can also be written in the position basis right this is also a valid expansion 
so i will in the in this expression for psi of i let me put this expression of psi in terms of the position basis and now of course i have to be careful i can't use the index i because the index i is already used so i have to use some index j let's say psi of j x j like this okay this i can write as follows i can bring the summation out here psi of j is just a number right it's just a complex number so i get p of i right that's my adjoint ket in my notation in my in my terminology or a bra vector in case you forgotten what an adjoint ket is it is in a product of that with x of j okay and what is this quantity this inner product will this inner product will just give you this phase factor okay so your fourier transform is the following exponent i and then um pi xj by h bar psi j right so i have gone from the so in the language of quantum mechanics i have gone from expressing a state in the position basis to the momentum basis right i performed a unitary transformation a rotation of my basis now when i extract the coefficients in the new basis those new those coefficients are given by an expression of this form right but what is this expression this is nothing more than the fourier transform this is the fourier transform of the function psi of j and the result of that transform is the tilde psi of i okay uh now i think i have less than a minute left uh so what is the utility of a fourier transform i'll just give you a very very simple example let's say you have a a wave like this okay so this this is something like let's say sin omega t right and so this is time and this is f of t okay if i calculate the fourier transform of this function right i will get a quantity f of omega right as a function of omega right so let me write this as sin omega not t what will the fourier transform of this function look like it will be something that is zero everywhere except at a single point at omega is equal to omega not at which point it becomes a this delta function right now imagine that you introduce a second wave which has twice the frequency right so you create a superposition of waves
like this right now this is given by sin 2 no omega t now and what is your total function become your total function becomes a sum of these it becomes sin omega t plus sin 2 omega t omega naught t right what will happen to my uh, to my fourier transform i will pick up another peak at omega is equal to 2 omega naught okay and let's say that in this function i put a factor of 1 half here what will happen to this peak it will be reduced by a factor of 1 half right so the fourier transform what it does is right it you can think of it as a frequency domain an analysis right it gives you the spectrum of your of your of your function or a signal or whatever you want to call it it gives you a spectrum right so this is the spectrum of my signal it is telling me which frequencies are present in the signal okay all right so i'll stop here i should have probably stopped earlier only uh, so that respect the fact that people have other classes to go to okay and uh, those of you who don't have other class to go to can of course uh, stick around and ask me questions uh, and those who want to leave can leave any question questions questions no questions shall i just stop the recording then i guess i'll do that chandanu you always save your questions for after record right no 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 sir i have no questions today mm -hmm.